Hey guys, today we're going to talk about thermal disorders and how we can help people when things get a little too hot or a little too cold. So let's get started. So when things get too hot, so there are three levels of thermal disorders for hot or um, heat related um, thermal disorders. So I kind of classify these, these are not like, this won't be on the exam, like kind of hot. <laughs> what you're gonna see is heat cramps. So, but these are kind of the levels. So like the lowest level of heat, um, uh, like a thermal disorder for a hot disorder you could have is have heat cramps. And we're gonna differentiate and talk about what the difference is here in a second. But there's heat cramps, pretty hot would be like heat exhaustion and super hot would be heat stroke. Um, so the important thing first to, to recognize is the nurse is who's going to be at risk for getting too hot. So you always have to think about those that are older and younger because both of these populations are going to be at higher risk because they have altered temperature regulation. As you get older, everything goes to crap and so everything starts falling apart, including your um, thermal regulation. And when you're very young, like babies, they also don't have the ability to completely regulate themselves. Um, those also living in hot conditions, so AKA you here, if you're watching this from Texas, it's probably summer, at least, well, it's summer most of the time in Texas, so, you know, um, uh, you know as a whole, um, living here or living in a more hot conditions is going to put you at higher risk. Um, you also have to think about um, work conditions, like, you know, people that work outside or work often in these conditions. Um, medications and street drug, uh, drug use, think things that are going to dry you out. Um, like, so things like um, when I'm talking about like medications, I'm thinking about like diuretics, anticholinergics, things like that, um, that are going to cause you to, um, you know, kind of uh, like lose fluid. Um, and then also having a history of cardiovascular disease and diabetes also puts you at risk for that dehydration, um, which can um, put you at risk for um, having a thermal, a hot thermal disorder. So let's break down these three um, hot thermal disorders. So the first one's heat cramps. Like I said, this is the lowest one or like it's the um, less serious, the least serious one. So um, it's uh, usually from heavy work or exercise. Um, it also relates to having enough, not enough hydration to meet the demand of whatever your hydration needs are. And what the patient's gonna complain about, they're gonna complain of severe muscle cramps, a racing heart, they're gonna be sweaty and feel weak. Uh, it, but it gets better when they elevate and do a gentle massage and we usually tell them, okay, avoid strenuous activity. We give them maybe some electrolyte fluid replacement. And if they need pain medication, we will give it maybe some anti-inflammatories, et cetera. Um, but uh, most of the time this resolves once they stop exerting themselves and rehydrate. So that's heat cramps. Next is heat exhaustion. So heat exhaustion, we're stepping it up one level. So this is more serious. Their temperature is going to be somewhere from 99.6 to 105.8. And yes, it can get that hot. I know you're probably thinking like, I didn't think it got that hot, but yeah, it's pretty scary, but it does. So this is from a more prolonged heat exposure. Oh, my spelling in these PowerPoints. Heat exposure, you know I love cardiac. That's why I put heart. <laughs> so yeah, prolonged heat exposure. So it's hours to days. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, this is gonna be more longer over time that you're going to see that um, they're, they're having this exposure to heat that uh, is causing it. So think of people like working outside in hot temperatures or doing heavy exercise in high temperatures. Um, they're gonna look, um, they're gonna have some GI symptoms, maybe some nausea, vomiting. Um, and then they start to have their cardiovascular symptom, uh, system involved. So like low blood pressure, high heart rate, might have increased anxiety. Um, they can even start to have some mental status changes because it's starting to affect some of the flow and um, starting to affect the brain. So you can kind of see where we went from cramps now to this. It's taking some of the symptoms to more of an extreme um, and things are getting worse. So what can we do for heat exhaustion? Um, fluid and electrolyte replacement is a must. Um, we can put like a moist sheet or towel over them and that helps um, uh, to allow for heat loss through that, especially like the, the wetness it allows for like, evap like evaporative loss, um, which is really helpful in these patients. Um, they may need hospital admission if they're not improving in a few hours. But cool them down and um, replace those fluids and electrolytes. Then heat stroke, this is a medical emergency. So this is greater than 105.8. The brain has completely lost all ability to regulate temperature. Um, this patient's gonna look like a massive vasodilation because remember heat opens blood vessels. Um, they're gonna have an increased respiratory rate, completely depleted fluid and electrolytes, um, really severe mental status changes because there's brain swelling and bleeding that can occur. Um, so we're gonna see much more of the cognitive stuff changing. Um, so for these patients, it's an emergency. So I need to do something right now. So I need to do rapid reduction in their core temperature. Um, I'm going to attach them to a, a heart monitor because they're going to be at risk for dysrhythmias and things like that. Give them 100% oxygen. 
correct any fluid and electrolyte balances they might have. And I really want to avoid shivering. There's actually medications I can give to um, decrease shivering. Um, but think of this, like if I'm trying to cool them down, but then they're shivering, shivering is your body's way to warm yourself up. And so if I am shivering, it's going to just make whatever I have going on worse. So I want to avoid all shivering. Um, and then, um, and I can't just tell them, hey, don't shiver. It's a body's response. So usually we have to give medications for that. Um, monitor urinary function because of the, um, the extreme heat and the muscles can start to break down and we can go into that rhabdomyolysis. Um, and so, um, and so we definitely want to be looking out for their um, kidney function and making sure that they're making good urine output. Um, and then do, I can change the environment because students always ask me this, are you allowed to do these things? And yes, you are. I can remove clothing. I can give them a cool bath. I can change the room temperature. I can put a fan on them. I can put ice packs on them. I can also do internal cooling. There's machines that we can put that um, it's actually like it goes in through the groin and it like is a balloon in the aorta and it regulates the body temperature. I can tell it to get cold or to get hot. And so I can go both ways. Um, and so, um, and pretty much it circulates in their circulatory system and helps like at their core to change that temperature. It just depends on how severe their heat stroke is. Um, and, you know, for these patients, keep in mind, because up here that where their brain is regulating their temperature is not working, sometimes these environmental modifications are key because I can sit there, I can't just give them a whole bunch of Tylenol because it's their brain functions not working. So I have to ex like internally and externally cool them down um, through some of these environmental modifications. All right, so let's talk about when things get cold. So there's only two cold problems. There's what we call local tissue freezing or frostbite, and then there's systemic freezing or whole body, which is hypothermia. Um, so who's gonna be at risk for cold problems? So those that are, again, very young and very old because they don't have that regulation like others do. Those living in cold living situations, which, you know, us in Texas, we've also learned about this recently. <laughs> so we might know a little bit about this, but people that are more like long-term or like always cold um, places, homelessness, it's common, um, alcohol, alcohol intoxication and smokers as well, because smokers are gonna have more vasoconstriction, um, which is going to lead them to um, be more at risk for, um, uh, these cold related injuries. So let's talk about frostbite. So frostbite is tissue freezing. It's, um, and what happens is there's decreased and slowed blood flow, which actually leads to cell tissue, tissue death. Um, so there can be superficial frostbite where like it's just involving the skin and subcutaneous tissues like the, it's usually like the ears, like these are the exposed areas like when you're out in the cold like the ears, the nose, the fingers and the toes. Um, and so the skin is going to look kind of waxy or pale yellow. It can't even be blue or mottled and it feels crunchy. I know you want to say that you're like, oh, the nose feels crunchy, but yes, it does. Feels crunchy and frozen. The patient may describe um, numbness and tingling or a burning sensation. Um, there's also deep frostbite, and that's going to be where it's all the way, like the tissue is frozen all the way in the muscles, bones, and tendons. The skin is going to be white, hard, and insensitive to touch. So like we're already going through, like you can see like with the superficial, the nerves are still there. They're having numbness, tingling, burning. They can feel this. It's very painful. We get into the deep frostbite. They can't even feel it. The nerves are completely dead. So we're really talking about that decreased, slowed blood flow and cell tissue death, because that's where when it gets deep, it starts getting into that gangrene, complete black cell cell tissue death. So for treatment, for superficial, um, the things to know, never squeeze, massage, or scrub it. Remove any constrictive clothing or jewelry. Um, so like anything close that's around it, you want it to be like, um, you know, blood to be able to flow as freely as possible. Because remember, this is a blood flow issue because of the frozen tissue. We immerse it in circulating warm soaks, warm water soaks, um, not hot, warm. You don't, you don't want to overdo it. Um, we do wound care for the blisters. And remember, these are people are also going to be at risk for infection. So we do that tetanus prophylaxis, like I talked about in my tetanus video. Um, and then pain management is key because remember they have that, that's really painful. Um, and they can have a lot of paresthesias and other nerve um, pain problems. And then for deep frostbite, I'm also going to um, immerse it in temperature controlled circulating water. Um, I'm going to elevate the extremity to reduce the deep. Now, some people struggle with this because they're like, oh, well, why would you elevate though? Because that's going to decrease. Like if I elevate something, it's going to decrease my blood flow here. But we have to reduce the edema until the edema goes down. I can't get that good flow. So I elevate it in order to reduce the edema, um, give IV analgesia. In other words, they're saying if it says IV analgesia, that means they need something stronger. Um, NSAIDs are going to help decrease some inflammation. Um, tetanus prophylaxis as well for these patients. They may require an amputation.
medication and then just really thorough wound care and antibiotics. Now, I know I said for deep frostbite that they may not feel anything, but um, if you're kind of confused why I'm saying IV analgesia, like this, like even though I, I, I don't want it to make it seem like superficial, they feel stuff deep, they don't feel anything. They're both super painful. I think it's just sometimes harder with superficial. Um, a lot of the nerves and stuff are still there where you, it might feel like, especially like those um, paresthesias can be very uncomfortable. But both of these are going to have a lot of pain. Um, so pain management is definitely a key there as well. But um, the biggest thing here, if you can see, like um, the best thing you can do when you're studying stuff like that is look, what's the overall picture? Like you can memorize a list like this, but can you look at the big picture? What's the big picture here? I need to focus on circulation, pain management, and monitoring and managing the infection, getting them that tetanus prophylaxis and very good wound care. So you always want to, um, anytime you read, watch any of my videos, make sure you're bringing everything together and trying to see what's the big picture. So let's talk about hypothermia. So that's a core temperature less than 95 degrees. So we talked about frostbite, which is a local problem. This is a systemic whole body problem. And at this point, just like with hyperthermia, where we talked about heat stroke, um, where the body cannot um, compensate, it's the same here, where the body just does not have the ability to get the, um, get the body warm again. So think things, uh, when you think cold, think vasoconstriction, the blood becomes thick, everything slows down, they're really at risk for dysrhythmias, blood clotting, um, there's a lot of issues here um, when it comes to things slowing down. So if it's a mild hypothermia, they might just be shivering, tired, confused. If it's moderate, they can get rigidity, bradycardia, slow respiratory rate, low blood pressure, and severe, like their mental, everything is gone. Absent reflexes, barely detectable vital signs, and they're in VFib. So um, I've definitely had some patients in the moderate um, stage, and they meet all those risk factors. They're usually homeless, have been drinking. You know, I had a guy one year that he decided that it was a better idea to um, like he couldn't pay for his bill to pay for his electricity. So he decided, well, he decided between like pay my bill for my electricity or buy alcohol. And he decided the alcohol because he thought the alcohol could keep him warm. But sadly, it actually um, pushed him farther into his hypothermia. So what do we do for him and for our other patients? We rewarm them. And just like in that heat stroke patient, we want to, because this is an emergency, we warm them internally and externally. So I always want to start with the core first. If I start with the extremities and move to the core, it can actually lead to shock. So I always want to warm my middle of my body, my, uh, my heart, my lungs, this core area first, and then I'm going to progressively move out to the extremities. Um, I need to monitor a core temperature and we can use that same device that I talked about before that goes in the aorta. Um, and so it's what we call an Alceus catheter. That's the brand name. You're never going to have that on an exam, um, but it goes up into the aorta and it can help rewarm them. We set the temperature and then it circulates and warms them or cools them depending on what we need them to do. Um, we do a gradual increase. We don't, if we go too fast, it can lead to hypotension and dysrhythmias. So we slowly raise them up and then we're checking labs really regularly because they're really high risk for coagulation issues. They're really high risk for um, dysrhythmia issues, a lot of imbalances. Uh, we want to correct any dehydration they may have, acid base imbalances, and then do really good EKG monitoring um, and treat any dysrhythmias that may come up. So yeah. So that is thermal disorders. It is illuminating and makes you uh, hopefully uh, will avoid some of these for yourself in the future. You know, don't go outside and, um, you know, go drinking in the middle of the winter. I do not recommend that. And if you're going to exercise in the middle of Texas in the summer, definitely make sure you stay hydrated. So that is Miss Woodruff's advice for the day. Have a great day. Bye.